ourselves. And we're not going to go down. If you want to come in here and tell us what to do, we're going to throw your ass out. And if you stop, stop that, we're going to kill you. I'm pulling my knife out and I'm fighting to the death. They want to fight, they'll get one. The series finale of the show, Breaking Bad, is one of the best TV endings I've ever seen. The series finale shows anti-hero Walter White fuse his id, ego, and superego. He finishes the synthesis of his Hegelian dialectic. All the while, the innocent Jesse Pinkman, a Christ figure without redemption, suffered the sins that came about when the show crossed a mentally ill loner with a society that abandoned him and treated him like trash. Before the start of the series, Walter was a man who was promised everything by virtue of his intelligence and his masculine will to power. His ideals and ambitions came to naught. He was feminized and sublimated. He lost his agency well before he ever had cancer. His demeaning jobs as a high school chemistry teacher and as a car wash monkey humiliated and undermined the brilliant scientist. Once he was finally pushed to the limit of his inhumanity and confronted with death, he gave in to his id. Heisenberg was born the moment Walter cracked and began making meth. The gentle everyman became dynamite, but dynamite cannot expound lethal force for long. The bodies of the damned men lying in Heisenberg's wake took everything from Walter. The trivial justification, I did it for my family, melted away, as the hypermasculine Ubermensch realized that giving in to your emotions, making yourself a slave of your passions, is no better than being a slave to your own inadequacies. Heisenberg killed his brother-in-law, murdered and endangered multiple innocents, damned Jesse Pinkman, and estranged his wife, son, and baby daughter. Walter had to return to Earth, resurrect Christ from his tomb, and put an end to the corruption he brought into the world, and then die as a consolidated man. I found that throughout the series, the fuel for Walter's dialectic is the complacency of Jesse Pinkman, a disenfranchised bum, a man that knows what it is like to be authentic, but unlike Christ, he chooses to give in to sin. Walter is a cruel god that burned his only son for his glory, and not for the benefit of men. Jesse felt the sublime emotion of bringing beauty into the world. He knew what it was like to be a carpenter, a man who molds beauty out of the natural world, but he chose to forsake a wholesome existence for that of degeneracy. He sold his art, his labor, his soul, for drugs, for meaningless pleasure. He took a bite out of the apple of knowledge and was cast out of Eden. He wanted to know the pleasures of hollow limit experiences because it felt good, because he was not content living with himself, because he was tempted by a fallen world. That is the story of the 1976 film Network, a media hellscape that features a fallen Christ figure that is killed for the sin of having low ratings. However, instead of Christ being resurrected and redeeming man, Christ sells man into the bondage of a comfy couch and unleashes Pandora's box of political violence. Media institutions radicalize extremists and then trivialize and sublimate dissent. This is the story of the media since its inception. From yellow journalists egging on the Spanish-American War to the yellow journalists of today egging on the American invasion of Iraq and continuing the intervention of the U.S. military in Syria. No, 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 no. Let's go way back. Whisper campaigns of religious subversion. The printing press unleashes radical pamphlets that spark the Protestant Reformation and cause a hundred years of Christian-on-Christian wars. No, 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 no. Farther back, before the printing press, mystery cults saturate the rotting carcass of the Roman Empire. The elites indulge themselves on Stoic ethics, while the mystery cults infect the lower classes. Information and its dissemination are a powerful thing. Information that conveys the changes in power distribution is how the structure behind the iron law of oligarchy functions. During the 1970s, there was a great fall in the quality and nature of the information dissemination of the nightly TV news. The professional, traditional ways of presenting news, the Walter Cronkites of the world, fell, and in their absence arose flashy extreme content. Explosions and morbidity get more butts in seats than straight-talking, matter-of-fact news anchors. News and entertainment merge, as if they were separate. I guess the real tragedy of the dull news is that the news finally stopped pretending that it was not entertainment. The hedonism innate in the media business model started showing. The 1976 movie Network is a masterpiece of satire that predicted the significant downturn in ethics and journalistic integrity and quality. It isn't a grand epic. It's a tragedy of interpersonal and societal decay. It has some of the traditional problems associated with Hollywood glorifying its imagined heydays, but I sympathize with the writer Patty Chayefsky's longing for authenticity in the news. The plot of the movie hinges on the insanity of news anchor Howard Beale. After losing his wife and his show declining in the ratings, Beale is fired and given one week left to be on TV before he is replaced. 
That night, Beal and an old TV executive friend of his, Max Schumacher, went out and got drunk. When Beal says that he is going to shoot himself, Schumacher jokingly tells Beal that he should kill himself live on TV. Then at least Beal's show would get some decent ratings. Devastated that the last thing keeping him sane has gone away, Beal says live on air that he will kill himself during the next segment of the show. He says that he has just run out of bullshit to say. Beal is quickly removed from the TV studio and fired. Schumacher, seeing that his new Subvision's budget is going to be cut, uses the remaining credibility that he has left to give Beal one last show to say farewell and to take the heat off the TV network. Instead of giving a solemn farewell address, Beal rants and raves about the state of the world. He gives a mad, impassioned speech that goes as follows. I don't have to tell you things are bad. Everybody knows things are bad. It's a depression. Everybody's out of work or scared of losing their job. The dollar buys a nickel's worth. Banks are going bust. Shopkeepers keep a gun under the counter. Punks are running wild in the street. And there's no one anywhere that seems to know what to do with us. We know the air is unfit to breathe. Our food is unfit to eat. And we watch our TVs while some local newscaster tells us today that we had 15 homicides and 63 violent crimes as if that's the way it's supposed to be. We know things are bad, worse than bad, they're crazy. It's like everything everywhere is going crazy, so we don't go out anymore. We sit in a house, as slowly the world we're living in gets smaller, and all we say is, please, leave us alone in our living rooms. Let me have my toaster, and my TV, and my steel-belted radials, and I won't say anything. Well, I'm not going to leave you alone. I want you to get mad. I don't want you to protest. I don't want you to riot. I don't want you to write to your congressman, because I wouldn't know what to tell you to write. I don't know what to do about the depression, and the inflation, and the Russians, and the crying in the streets. All I know is that you've first got to get mad. You've got to say, I'm a human being, goddammit. My life has value. So, I want you to get up now. I want you to get up out of your chairs. I want you to get up right now and go to the window, open it, and stick your head out and yell, I'm mad as hell and I'm not going to take this anymore. I want you to get up right now. Get up. Go to your windows, open up your windows, and stick your head out and yell, I'm mad as hell and I'm not going to take this anymore. Things have got to change, my friends. You've got to get mad. You've got to say, I'm mad as hell and I'm not going to take this anymore. Beale became a national sensation. People stuck their heads out of their windows and shouted onto the streets, I'm mad as hell and I'm not going to take this anymore. This mirrors what Slavoj Žižek prescribed to deal with the insanity of our world today. Žižek suggests that we must first give in to our despair, and then we may find ourselves and find a way out of our despair. Although Beale's descent was only really caused by his own personal grief, he comes to genuinely believe that his message of hopeless and despair. Later on in the film, he makes the claim that he has seen the face of God. Beale's populist descent, his revolt against the modern world, is then commodified. A young programming executive named Diana Christensen has been looking forward to the opportunity to establish herself in the network. She previously made pitches to open up programming to show radical communists and terrorists committing crimes as part of the nightly news. She convinces the other executives to give Beale his own show, and in Beale's wake, a stampede of frauds were platformed. Beale's corporate cosmology will host a communist revolutionary, a new age religious fanatic, a celebrity drama portion, and a conspiracy theorist. Meanwhile, Schumacher and Diana became lovers. Their adulterous relationship hinged on the fact that Schumacher is looking for something new and exciting instead of his old and loving wife, and Diana has no shame in seeking meaningless pleasure. This adultery symbolizes the bastardization of the news into something that is not made with love and passion, but with lust and greed. Schumacher tells Diana, You are a television incarnate, Diana, indifferent to suffering, insensitive to joy. All of life is reduced to the common rubble of banality. Diana was truly incapable of understanding what love is, what it feels like to be loved, and what it is like to give true, altruistic, selfless, wholesome, real love. Beale continued to rant and rave about the modern world and its problems. He denounced the falsehood of the news while becoming one of the most popular TV celebrities, a 1970s incarnation of John Oliver. Beale attracted over 63 million television viewers per show. He proclaimed an absolute hypocrisy. This tube is the gospel, the ultimate revelation. This tube can make or break presidents, popes, prime ministers. This tube is the most awesome goddamn force in the whole godless world. And woe to us if it ever fails into the hands of the wrong people. We deal in illusions, man. None of it is true, but you people sit here day after day, night after night, all ages, colors, creeds, we're all you know. You're beginning to believe the illusions we're spitting here. You're beginning to think that the tube is reality and that your own lives are unreal. 
You do whatever the tube tells you. You dress like the tube, you eat like the tube, you raise your children like the tube, you even think like the tube. This is mass madness, you maniacs. In God's name, you people are the real thing. We are the illusion. So turn off your television sets. Turn them off now. He was a prophet of consumer capital, readily packaged, easy to consume, and leaves the consumer with a vague sense of validation. Beale was supposed to take on the sins of the angry public and express the popular resentment so cozy people did not have to. Beale told the truth that everybody was either unable or unwilling to communicate. By telling the truth theatrically, no one had to go out and be their own advocate. It's not a coincidence that Beale's show has a stained glass window church background in the back of the set. Beale is Christ taking on the sins of the world, so you don't have to. Unlike Christ, Beale is a deceiver, a false prophet. Beale is a crutch for real political activism. Beale is part of the system that keeps the public in check. On one of his next shows, Beale, in his stupidity, accidentally bit the hand that platformed him. Beale was an unchained evangelical dog. How was he supposed to know that he shouldn't have told his audience to prevent a Saudi Arabian conglomerate from buying his network's parent company? Beale was not destroyed by the network, but absorbed into the corporate machine. The chairman of the network, Arthur Jensen, scheduled a meeting, and during this meeting, he proceeded to destroy Beale's soul, and changed Beale into his puppet. Jensen says, in an impassioned and demeaning lecture, you are an old man who thinks in terms of nations and peoples. There are no nations, there are no peoples, there are no Russians, there are no Arabs, there are no third worlds, there is no West. There is only one holistic system of systems, one vast and immane, interwoven, interacting, multivariate, multinational dominion of dollars, petrodollars, electrodollars, multidollars, Reichmarks, rins, rubles, pounds, and shekels. It is an international system of currency which determines the totality of life on this planet. That is the natural order of things. That is the atomic and subatomic and galactic structure of things. And you have meddled in the primal forces of nature, and you will atone. Am I getting through to you, Mr. Beale? You get up on your little 21-inch screen and howl about America and democracy. There is no America. There is no democracy. There is only IBM and ITT and at t and DuPont, Dow, Union Carbide, and Exxon. Those are the nations of the world today. What do you think the Russians talk about in their councils of state? Karl Marx? They get out their linear programming charts, statistical decision theories, minimax solutions, and compute the price-cost probabilities of their transactions and investments, just like we do. We no longer live in a world of nations and ideologies, Mr. Beale. The world is a college of corporations, inexorably determined by the immutable bylaws of business. The world is a business, Mr. Beale. It has been since man crawled out of the slime. And our children will live, Mr. Beale, to see that perfect world, in which there's no war, or famine, or oppression, or brutality. One vast and ecumenical holding company, for whom all men will work to serve a common profit, in which all men will hold a share of stock. All necessities provided, all anxieties tranquilized, all boredom amused. And I have chosen you, Mr. Beale, to preach this evangel. Beale was finished. Although he preached the globalist capitalist message of Jensen perfectly, Beale no longer had any standing with the public. The public wanted Beale to give them cotton candy rage, not give them saccharine solace. Within a couple weeks, viewership plummeted, and the public found another false prophet to consume. Beale and Diana changed the media landscape. The public was fed up with the bullshit, so they doubled down on the bullshit. But this time, the bullshit was sleek and stylized. After seeing Beale's show take a downturn in the ratings, the network executives then proceeded to plot to assassinate Beale live on air. The revolutionary communists machine-gunned down Beale live while the camera filmed everything. Beale was ritualistically killed for having low ratings. Fortunately for the Ecumenical Liberation Army, the show was programmed for another season on the network and the media machine kept churning out hits. What is the message of Breaking Bad and Network? The theme of both is containment of dissidents that revolt against broken promises. Walter and Beale were promised careers, fame, fortune, and family, but circumstances from beyond their control caused them to become disenchanted with the status quo. This results in them revolting in their own ways, only for them to make the world a worse, more inhumane place. To deal with economic misfortunes and personal issues, people turn to drugs, and the brilliant, disaffected chemistry teacher Walter White is willing to revolt against the modern world to bring them to you. 
to deal with social unrest and economic downturns of the 1970s, people turned to a televised false messiah to articulate their pain. The system has a Darwinian selection mechanism that protects the status quo like antibodies. The law enforcement of Breaking Bad, as embodied by Hank Schrader, looked down on Walter when he was weak and tried to take Heisenberg down when he became out of their control. When the news became too sanitized and devoid of human compassion, a simulation of humanity is produced to quell popular discontent. In a weird kind of way, the media encourages people to act out. If large social systems keep people in line with the spectacle of fearsome acts, lone rebels and terrorists are necessary. They're actually kind of fun. It's somewhat gratifying watching Walter reclaim his manhood by building an axis of evil. But Walter's descent is commodified. His plans come to naught because we, the audience, fantasize deep down about revolt. We are all Walter White. We are all Howard Beale. We are all going insane from the sheer scale of the world we are up against. Both of these stories are the tales of how the culture industry sucks in and spits out Christ. This is why Breaking Bad is one of the greatest TV shows of all time, and why Network is one of my favorite movies. Yeah.